Yeah, I think he excellent. Dear participants, it's a pleasure for me to deliver these opening remarks. Finland is very happy to collaborate with UNIDO to provide a platform to discuss this extremely important and timely topic. Closing gender gap is in science, technology, engineering and mathematics is imperative for achieving sustainable and inclusive industrial and economic development. This closely relates to the topic of the CSW this year, which is about economic empowerment of women and girls and addressing poverty as means to accelerate gender equality. Gender equality and women's empowerment are key drivers of economic and sustainable growth. We know that gender segregation in labor market begins already from childhood and education. It reflects the educational choices of women and men, which are heavily affected by the norms and stereotypes of our society. We must work con consciously to break the stereotypes and norms surrounding what women and girls can or should become. Educational institutions play an important role in this. They are in a position where they can help eliminate these obstacles by actively promoting gender equality and taking concrete steps to ensure girls can follow their interests and talents. When technology is developed by men and for men, it may even become discriminatory against women. If women are not involved in technological development, the sector does not understand women's needs and reflects reflect the actual gender distribution in society. We must also work to make the STEM field fields more receptive and welcoming towards women by eliminating all forms of harassment and discrimination still prevalent in many heavily gender segregated fields. In conclusion, it's important to promote gender equality and empowerment of women and girls in STEM education and careers. Finland has funded UNIDO activities in this field. It's vital to address root causes and challenge and shift the gen uh, gender stereotypes and norms that discourage women and girls from pursuing their interests and talents in all levels of STEM fields. With these words, I wish you inspiring and thought provoking discussion today. Thank you very much. You're muted, Cecilia. Precisely, didn't. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CSW 68 on light side event organized by UNIDO and the government of Finland. It is an honor, it is an honor to have you all here today as we delve into strategies for increased participation and leadership of women in STEM fields. As we gather here under the umbrella of the Commission of the Status of Women, let us remind ourselves of the vital role in promoting gender equality and empowering women worldwide. Today's event aligns with these objectives, focusing specifically on closing the gender gap in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, STEM industries. 
Before we proceed further, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to the government of Finland for their cooperation and support in organizing this event. Additionally, I want to express our appreciation to Her Excellency Mrs. Sani Grant Lassonen, Minister of Social Security, Government of Finland, for her opening remarks delivered by video. Your message adds value, valuable insights to foster our discussions today. Advancing gender equality in STEM is not just a matter of fairness. It is a fundamental prerequisite for sustainable and inclusive industrial development. It is about harnessing the full potential of our societies, ensuring that no talent is left, left untapped, and creating a future where everybody can thrive. Throughout our session, we will hear from distinguished speakers representing, representing various sectors and perspectives. We will explore success stories, confront challenges, and chart pathways for the future. Each story and insight shared today adds another layer of, to our understanding of how we can foster a more inclusive STEM, STEM landscape. Advancing gender equality in STEM is not just a goal, it is a shared responsibility. By working together, we can dismantle barriers, create opportunities, and pave the way for a more inclusive and prosperous world for all. Thank you for your participation, and let's start our conversation today. We are very privileged to count on panelists with different backgrounds who will speak from the perspective of the private sector companies with a global reach, entrepreneurship, if our panelists manage to join in us, to join us, and industrial skills development. We will, we will engage in two rounds of questions for each of them, and possibly a third one if the time allows. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to this panel and for generosity in sharing your experience on fostering women and uh, empowerment in the STEM industries. So let's turn to our first speaker. So Mrs. Hannah Worikowski, Tieto Every Global Head of People and Culture. Uh, Tieto Every is a Finnish technology company providing IT and product engineering services. It ex its experts specialize in cloud data and software, serving thousands of enterprises and public sector customers in more than 90 countries. So, Hannah, uh, young people are key stakeholders of digital development. Nevertheless, young people, bo boys and girls, have voiced their concern about the lack of inclusion of youth in digital advancement. Tito Every has several very successful youth engagement programs and initiatives. Could you please describe the youth engagement activities with both high schools and university students, please? Sure, and, and uh, what a privilege uh, to be here and uh, great opening words from Sunny as well. Um, this is a really important topic and has been uh, a really important uh, topic uh, for us in Tieto Every already for many years. Uh, we we have several different initiatives going on. Uh, I think one strong basis to create the future diverse workforce within Tieto Every is our strong university collaboration network mm -hmm. in, in Finland, but of course uh, uh, globally as well. Uh, and, and we do it so that our own young employees uh, are actively involved and alumni from local educational institutes, they participate actively uh, in, in organizing different kind of activities. I can see here in the office, uh, you know, office visits uh, with students and different kind of after work gatherings. So the networks are super important to the uh, to the yo younger generation. But uh, in, in addition, we participate actively also in different kind of student events and uh, recruitment fairs. Um, and um, in, in, in those, I can really also hear and feel that the demand of a diverse and inclusive workforce is becoming more a hygiene factor and something that every single company needs to take into consideration. And that's why we feel also we, we are not doing this only alone. We partner with different kind of organizations here in Finland, like, uh, for example, Women in Tech or Inclusive. There's also a, a organization called Mimmit Koda, uh, so in, in English, uh, Girls Coding. Uh, and we collaborate uh, to to create growth opportunities for the younger younger people. 
And then one really concrete thing is our graduate program uh, and why I want to lift this uh, especially is that we started some three years, four, four or five years back um, doing the graduate recruitment in a bit different way. So we started a gamified uh, recruitment uh, approach, which is also anonymized so that our unconscious biases, which we all have as, as human beings, are not uh, interfering in decision making. And uh, that gamified, anonymized recruitment approach has really helped us uh, improve our gender balance within the graduates. So it has really increased from around 35 percent to uh, closer to 50 percent. So now it's uh, it's uh, depending on the year from 45 to 50 percent. And this is really, I think, a great um way of uh, of also proving that uh, that when you do conscious decisions and you don't let unconscious biases interfere then it is possible to to gain uh, some kind of uh, improvement and even if uh, women are minority in uh, stem uh, studies, uh, we can still uh, find uh, more women to, to be interested in uh, approaching or, or uh, wanting a tech career. So it's really important to engage and offer uh, the networking opportunities for the young professionals. And there's also different kind of uh, so-called not professional, but more like uh, networks, like young professionals, which are doing also outside, outside of Tieto Every with other companies, uh, some collaboration. And then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention is, uh, is this, because universities and, and higher elementary school, schools are one thing, but the, the choices and the the thinking uh, needs to start already much uh, earlier. So now we ha we are testing. We have bu built together with uh, with uh, the Children and Youth Foundation in Finland uh, a concept call called Digital Future School, and this is uh, something that uh, offers free tools and reliable information for youth, uh, grades fifth up, from fifth grade up upwards. Um, and and really, you know, trying to influence their thinking in a very early stage, so that uh, you know the youngsters have a, have a, a, a real picture of what a career in tech uh, could mean for for them, for example. So these these are some of the actions and and things that we have been doing. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. <laughs> for your valuable insights. I think the importance of early networking, early engaging, and in particular to addressing, even using new techniques of our unconscious biases, I think is very, very important. So thank you very much for that. So now I would like to turn to Mrs. Susanna hendenberg Rosenquist. Uh, she's Kone Senior Manager of Culture and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Uh, Kone is a global leader in the elevator and escalator industry, headquartered in Finland. The company's mission is to improve the flow of urban life and um, make the world cities better and more sustainable places to live. Uh, Susanna, uh, Kone has been recognized by Forbes among the world's best employers, and this year the Financial Times has also recognized the company as one of the diversity leaders. What are the top factors making Kone a leading workplace when it comes to diversity? Could you please share any success story or practices fostering a supportive environment for women in operational STEM roles, please? Thank you, Cecilia, for the introduction and, and thanks for having me on this panel. It's a great topic. Uh, why are we a great workplace for diverse employees? Well, that's of course a question more to our employees than to maybe me, but uh, what our maybe latest engagement surveys tell us that we are uh, above the global norm when it comes to employee engagement, uh, well-being and inclusion indexes. So I guess we are doing something right. Um, I think one of the most important things is that um, as for many other companies, but also for us, our first strategic target is to be a great place to work and sustainability in all its forms, also social, social sustainability is at the core of our strategy. So as such, the diversity, equity and inclusion agenda is really a key focus area for all of us 
And we have for several years already applied a very uh, structured and systematic approach um, to advancing DEI, and we have set really ambitious targets for ourselves uh, to improve uh, diversity within our organization, but also to fostering an inclusive uh, and psychologically safe culture, uh, because obviously without, without the inclusion, there is no diversity. Um, secondly, we, when we talk about diversity, uh, that means many different things for us. So we talk obviously about gender diversity, but we also talk about cultural diversity and diversity of different perspectives and, and experiences. And by that we, have, uh, for example, mean hiring from outside of our own industry to ensure that we also have a very diverse uh, thinking within our organization. Then, of course, we are a truly global company, as you mentioned. We are operating in over 60 countries and having over 150 nationalities. So we are diverse uh, as it is. But we do operate in a very male dominated industry. Uh, and of our total workforce, actually, only around 12% are female. So that is, of course, a very uh, key theme for us and why we need to work really hard on the gender diversity. And as we have two thirds of our, our organization is blue collar workforce, where the percentage is obviously then, then even lower than that 12. So that is, is really something where we need to, to focus on. We have set a clear target for ourselves uh, that we want to have over 35% of our director level females or director level positions held by female by 2030. And each year we're closing the gap uh, towards that target. But that, of course, means that we need to both attract female talent. We need to develop our current female talent pipelines. And as I think I saw in the chat as well, retain uh, our current uh, female talent and, and uh, make sure that we're not losing them. And, and some of the methods we have applied, applied for this is, uh, for example, having active uh, global employee resource groups for women, having dedicated female talent programs, uh, female apprentice programs, uh, flexible working practices, etc., to support uh, this us in this aim. And I think it's very much about um, kind of enabling uh, women and reducing the barriers, the structural barriers they might encounter in, in their work life. Uh, then maybe my last point would be that in order to, to create that psychologically safe uh, culture and, and gain that diversity and really advance within uh, creating, for example, gender equality, uh, we of course need to have full support from, from leadership in an organization of our size and, and really uh, kind of have that on the leadership agenda as well as the ownership agenda. Uh, and to quote our fresh CEO, the world's population is 50-50, so why should we settle for anything less than that? So that is the sentiment we, we believe in, and, and uh, we're working very hard to close the gap. Thank you very much, Susana, and also thank you for sharing with us, you know, the, the constant challenge that represents that um, achieving gender parity right that within the workforce this is really work in progress and i think it's you know it only shows also the commitment of the company you know i i mean i know this doesn't solve the problem but usually sometimes having very concrete targets and having a real kind of plan on how to get there is very important and um and i think you know it's, it's of course a, a task for all of us right i mean the from inside the company but also from the society because as you rightly mentioned is this is a very very male dominated field and um, there are many things that need to change in society in order to allow really proper participation of women but um but thank you very much for showing that you know there is lots of determination and uh, although not everything is perfect we are really striving you know in order to get uh, to get there and to as you said you know we are 50 percent of the population i don't see why not we cannot be 50 percent of the leadership and the workforce right thank you and uh, i'm very pleased also now to to see rita you know mrs uh, rita ide hi <laughs> hello rita is a clean a clean tech entrepreneur founder and ceo of the ecobacter company Ecobacter is a sustainable waste management company based in Nigeria. Ecobacter leverages technology to collect waste directly from households and other consumer groups, while it enables them to use their waste as a digital currency. 
So, so Rita, as a successful women entrepreneur in the clean tech sector, how how have you navigated building and growing your business in a predominantly technical field? And can you share please insights into the strategies or approaches that have been effective for you? Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia, and thank you, you know, to the planning committee for having me. Big apologies for the network problem that delayed me getting in and for the network problem that I would most probably even experience as I speak because it's it's crappy here. Um, my name is Rita and yes, I run a clean tech um, platform in Nigeria that enables people to collect waste, you know, um, of course, leveraging technology and some of the biggest things that has helped in, you know, how we have built Eco Barta, which is the name of the company, to the stage that we are currently in, in is first, just constant um, learning and development. So I'm not a technical founder, I'm more of a business development ex expert, and Eco Barta did not even start as a technology, technology company, but we've evolved into that because that's where the 21st century solutions, you know, are coming from. And so I've had to constantly learn. I've taken it quite a number of um, development classes. I've taken, you know, I've had to create a, pro a, a continuous learning program for myself. I've had to create a continuous learning program for even members of my staff and our community in general. And that has meant that even as we bring on, you know, um, technical experts, as we bring on software developers, as we, as we bring on UI, UX product designers, the people that are non-technical on the team, including myself, are not left behind. So we are able to understand the, the, the terms, the conversations, and we're able to also contribute into building a successful company. Um, the other thing that we've also done is the need for documentation. So we make sure that uh, no matter what we do at the company, right, we are constantly documenting the best practices, we're constantly creating standard operating procedures, we're constantly just creating. Um, can you hear me, please? Let me confirm that. Yes, I can hear you. As okay, <laughs> okay. So we are constantly creating documentations to, you know, translate whatever the technical experts and the technical people are building and are doing into languages that anybody can pick up and can work on. And, you know, those two strategies have um, really helped in us building a successful company. And of course, the most important element I would also say is just constantly showing up. Whatever it is, even if you do not know, just show up and, you know, you would learn as as, as the time go, um, goes on. So, um, again, building network, consistent, um, con continuous learning and documentation are some of the strategies that we've implemented to ensure that as a female founder, as a non-technical founder, in a you know technology field building a clean tech we we're able to stay afloat and not even just survive but to ensure that we are one of the leading companies in nigeria thank you very much rita and i think you know your effort to document you know your uh, your your experience i think is extremely valuable you know as you know as we work in need on we definitely try to actually motivate the change also, you know, among uh, the people who work with us, our partners in in the several projects that we basically implement around the world. And this kind of, you know, uh, activity of documenting the things and really, you know, sort of trying to to give some kind of record on, you know, on the process and how do you manage really to, to overcome the challenges of, uh, you know, of really your role as entrepreneur, I think is extremely important. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me now take the, you know, uh, talk to a little bit to, to Matthias Larsen. Matthias works at UNIDO's Learning and Knowledge Development Facility. Uh, the Learning and Knowledge Development Facility, so we know it as uh, LKDF, is a platform that promotes industrial skills development among young people in developing economies. Through private-public partnerships, the LKDF supports the establishment and upgrading of local industrial training academies to help meet the labor market's increasing demand for skilled employees, thus contributing to the inclusive and sustainable industrial development. Uh, Matthias, uh, UNIDO's LKDF focuses on capacity building and skills development in developing countries. How does the organization ensure gender equality and inclusivity in the training programs, particularly in the climate-related and technical fields? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, for allowing me to to take part in this panel. Um, maybe I should say first that the LKDF is also the the internal facility that we have at UNIDA for promoting demand oriented skills development, and it's. Uh, a facility that has a number of projects on skills development that are part of it. So by now we've had 17 different projects and they've all been in different countries. And uh, for different reasons, they have mostly been in Africa and also in fact in quite male dominated uh, areas. So we've had um, programs that have been training in heavy duty equipment, uh, mechanics, uh, commercial vehicle driving, uh, training in the mining industry. So really very male dominated areas. Um, but of course, uh, you know, our approach to it is to always make sure that we foster an inclusive environment that prioritizes gender equality, that we implement inclusive strategies uh, in the training programs and that, um, you know, that they have gender sensitive content and that we do what we can to promote participation of women. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we see is that uh, advocating for female role models is, is very uh, important. And, you know, the, the LKDF, it's a learning and knowledge development facility. So the first letter is for learning. So based on those experiences over those 17 projects, we've, we've seen certain things that, that uh, work in promoting um, greater participation of, of, of women in these trainings. So, for example, um, in, in one of the projects in Ethiopia, which I happen to be personally involved in myself, we had, and this was for um, heavy duty equipment mechanics, so mechanics of trucks and buses and equipment, or sorry, in construction equipment. Uh, so really uh, not the, the kind of sector that you would typically think that there would be a, a, an even rate of men and women. But, uh, you know, at, as it stands now, and, and this is now, I, I believe it is uh, eight years down the line. In fact, there are 25% uh, female participants. And if we compare that with uh, the level of the same same training in, in Sweden, which is where I come from and which is where the country that supported that program is from. It's in Sweden, it was 14 percent at that time. So how is that possible? Well, I think that we we had specific assumptions of uh, the role of cultural norms, uh, that it would be very difficult for us to to make a change or to have an impact. But we saw that uh, we had a few uh, women who were part of the training from the very beginning and were uh, very enthusiastic and very uh, successful and in fact uh, you know in, at some point it was very clear that the female uh, trainees were actually outperforming the, the their male counterparts even in this sector but that meant that we had some role models very early on and they uh, eventually became trainers themselves. So there was this positive, uh, positive successes that we could build on. And uh, also we realized that our assumptions that the cultural norms would uh, play a part turned out to not be that straightforward because we, we did some analyses and we showed that it's not, they were not so much uh, considering what you know, what was expected in from the uh, society at large, but more what, what their peers would say. So that gave an, an indication that, you know, if you have uh, other women who, you know, are forerunners, then you can, you can build a good case and you can show that uh, this is uh, a good way to, to proceed. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for sharing also with us this uh, this example. I think is sometimes I think it's also easy to hide behind the social norms, right? And we sort of have the a priori is going to be difficult, it's not going to work, so let's not do it. And I think precisely your message is the opposite, right? I think, um, of course, I mean, we, we all know that, you know, I mean, there, there, are, there are very strong uh, reasons why sometimes it's difficult for societies to change. But then we have the role, the, the, the actually the role of the role models, actually, that uh, can really be 
very, very important and, and, and trigger, you know, changes in society, which I think is not, the effect is not negligible. So, so thank you very much for this. I think, uh, you know, we have talked a little bit about what you do, what you're, you know, in, what do you do in your, dif in your different uh, occupations and, uh, and the places of work. And uh, I think we can start now with the second round of questions and basically referring to challenges. So I, I would like to start again with Hannah. So, Hannah, in your experience, what are some of the main challenges that women face in pursuing and advancing the, their careers in STEM fields, and how can we address the challenges? Well, uh, I, I've been reading some of the comments here in, in the chat, uh, chat as well, and uh, definitely, uh, of course, after they have been, uh, you know, pursuing their uh, career in in STEM, one big, uh, big, big challenge to to also solve is how to keep uh, them in technology industry, uh, and that's kind of I, I think even a, a different a different topic than than we have the, uh, have here at our hand today. H however, if we start with uh, with uh, some of the main challenges that the women face in pursuing and uh, and advancing their careers, I think one um one one thing that i already mentioned is that the choices uh, uh start uh, already quite early and what choices you make in education and it seems that even worldwide uh women uh, that choose the stem are approximately one third of all women so interfering with the thinking and uh, and biases and having role models already for an early uh, early um, age is one of the key things that uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we should think about uh, we, we did a study some time ago where, where we found quite alarming results uh, only 15 percent of female students from the age of 15 years to yeah. 25 years in both finland and Norway considered education of a, a career in tech. So half of these girls who, who uh, replied to the survey considered that the tech is boring or complicated. So we, we need to spark an interest in, in technology and that starts already in, in childhood and having role models. And then of course also every company will more or less be a tech company in, in the future. It's mm -hmm. not boring. It's everything but boring. So we also published this kind of uh, being an IT girl booklet uh, that provides girls and their parents uh, and teachers actually with practical insights into the industry. And also it's variety of different kind of roles and po possible career paths. Not everybody needs to be a, a developer or, or a coder. So that, that guide is targeted to girls uh, aged 15 and, and uh, 15 to 18 and, and their parents. And uh, work needs to be done already in the early stage with the schools. And then uh, advancing in their careers in tech, that of course comes very much back to every single uh, uh, day, how uh, day in, in the job. So uh, how is the culture built? Is it is it truly diverse? Uh, is it uh, truly inclusive? Uh, is it safe? Do you feel psychological safety? How is the equity? How is the parental leaves? How are you treated in the internal processes? And the, the whole inclusion and diversity thinking needs to go through every single uh, process that the company has. So every time you're doing uh, changes in the organization, you need to think about who are the best talents into this uh, role, not the usual suspects. Every time you need to drive those same ambitious, uh, ambitious goals, we also have a, an ambitious goal of 50-50 of by 2030. Right now we are around 30% uh, women in Finland, which is better in, in te uh, than, than in tech industry. Um, uh, in general, but still we are we are far from from the overall target. But we still believe that the target needs to be ambitious, and we don't need to be perfect, but we need to do actions to, towards that. And of course, th this is not something a company uh, does only because it's the right thing to do. It's uh, something companies should do also because it shows without any. Uh, doubt that companies who are 
uh, having focus on inclusion, diversity, equity, sustainability, they are doing also financially a, a better job. So it should be on, on every single company's uh, agenda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. I, I wish I could get that guide. <laughs> I can send sounds... you a link. I'll send you a link. I can put it in the chat. <laughs> because it sounds very, very interesting. Yeah, and and also, actually... thank you for reminding us, you know, that all companies will be tech companies. So, I mean, this yeah, is really reality. Yeah. If you really want to continue in the labor market, you need to definitely engage with technology. So, there's no way out, right? So, I think this is a very, very important point, as well as, you know, making a little bit the economic case, right? I mean, uh, Unfortunately, sometimes you have to make the economic case for, at the forefront because, you know, you deal a lot with people, those who are not convinced, they need to see the numbers. Why is it important to engage with women? Why is it important to have a diverse workforce in terms of profitability, in terms of competitiveness, etc.? But um, I think it's, of course, I mean, it's a very strong element. And, uh, you know, in many cases, it's important also to document that, right? And then sometimes we lack the information, but it's extremely, it's a, it's a very, very important point. So thank you so much. Um, then, Susana, uh, Kone operates in various countries with different cultural norms and societal expectations. How does the company navigate and address cultural aspects of gender equality across its global operations? Yes, uh, well, what you just mentioned is a fact, uh, and it obviously poses a challenge for us. Uh, so obviously there is a big variance between the different geographical areas where we operate, going from Europe to Americas to Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa, and then to China. And of course, uh, sitting from example in Finland and, and having maybe that Finnish and Nordic perspective, it's really important not to be naive and to really understand the realities um, everywhere. And uh, I think we have tackled uh, or addressed this uh, in a few different ways. Um, firstly, even though we understand that there are different uh, contexts in different uh, areas of the world, we anyway would like us all to share the same ambition and, and vision. Let's say that our, our ambition is to increase uh, the number of women in our organization, but then we need to be really realistic in, in where do we set the bar uh, and put it into that cultural context. So, for example, we celebrate a first ever uh, elevator service technician in India in the same way we celebrate a 50-50 uh, gender diverse leadership team in the Nordics, because those are equally important steps and, and in that cultural context, equally important and, and big things. So it's really important that we kind of acknowledge that and acknowledge and, and celebrate uh, these what might seem in somewhere as a really small thing, but there it might be a huge thing. So I think that's that's one one way of looking at that. Then I would say and echo what what Hanna and, and uh, also many in the chat have been been mentioning about the role modeling and the representation. And uh, there we aim to share and spread internal career stories and promote our female talent whenever we can to also ensure we showcase where we have been able to broken through the glass ceiling uh, and inspire others elsewhere to strive for the same, to kind of show that uh, what is uh, possible in some area, parts of the world should be equally possible in others. And then we can kind of bridge the, bridge the gap uh, between these. Um, and then I think what we have learned also in the past years when working uh, in a more structured way uh, on advancing diversity, equity and inclusion, that it is really important that we do it on the grassroots level and, and locally, that we cannot from a corporate or organizational perspective uh, be, of course we can set the scene and, and kind of set the ambition, but really the, the work needs to be, be done uh, where it's relevant and where we understand how it has the biggest impact. So I think those are, are things that we have considered uh, when thinking about the global scope and, and the different challenges in, in different parts of the world. 
Thank you, Susana. Thank you. And also, you know, just for reminding us that it's not uh, a one size fits all, right? I mean, it's oh. good to have global ambitions, but it's also good to have to tailor our messages to local realities and really move even, you know, small steps make a, a long journey if we are able and persistence to really continue and we know where we want to get, right? Mm -hmm. So so thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, Rita. In your journey as a female entrepreneur in cleantech, what specific challenges have you encountered while establishing and scaling up your business? Yeah, so um, cleantech and female founder are like two sides of a, of a coin. Because so clean tech, especially in Nigeria, is an emerging space. And then you have the female founder that is also like a minority practice, so to speak. So it, it's, it's such a challenging space to be. First, um, there is already the lack of representation and lack of, you know, role models like everybody here. And as mentioned, that, you know, everybody has spoken about it. So there is really nobody that you're modeling yourself or your business after. When we've had cases, for example, when we've um, we were talking to certain investors and they asked, um, "How are you? Like, on what basis are you even putting some of the figures that we put there?" And in the clean tech space, there is literally nobody that is that you're modeling after because you're probably even pioneering new things, like some of the things that you're doing yourself. So that's one of the challenges because it's definitely easier if you're in a space whereby you know you have role models, you have people, you, you, there are standard practices to how stuff is done already. The second thing is also again being a a clean tech founder for now. You know, in Nigeria again, you have to more or less build an entire ecosystem. So our solution is in waste management, but and we build technology to collect and transform waste. Ordinarily, you would think that. We will just have tech experts on board just building technologies. But first, we have to build the technology. Second, we have to build the physical collection infrastructures because those are not there. The government have not invested in them over time, right? So for our technology to be able to actually solve a problem and not just be some fine fines to have, you know, application on Google Play Store or iOS, you have to actually build, you know, physical collection infrastructures. And after investing a lot in collection infrastructures, you have to then start to educate the people because again, there is a huge um, gap and lack of awareness and the need for clean technology, even climate change trend solutions to sustainable waste management. There's a lot of gap in knowledge when, when you go down to like the, the people in, in Nigeria and even most sub-Saharan African countries. So that means we are a for-profit clean technology company, but we're having to build you know, infrastructures on the ground, which then makes us a logistics company. And then we're also having to lead campaigns, which even makes some people mistake us for a non-profit or a civil society organization, because we are constantly having a campaign about this, a campaign about that. You know, so that's also another challenge. And then as a female founder, there is the issue of balancing and expectations and you know, structural biases. So I, for one, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a new mother and, you know, um, between managing your time being a mother, managing your time being a wife, managing your time being a founder, and the thing, the, the sad part is everything requires 100% of your time. So it's not as if you can do this 50%, you can do this on 20%. So it, you need about five of yourself to actually be able to deliver within a day, and that's that's another big, big challenge. Um, and of course, there are the expectations and the structural biases about um, that already even limit women lack of access to, you know, investment at the rate at which, you know, your, the male counterparts would get them or how people would come to you already with prejudice, already with certain um, mindset. And that affects your communication and your ability to raise funds or, you know, even just sign certain contracts. And how we've, I personally have been able to, you know, address some of this is just, First, to ensure that you have as many people around you that are good support system, you know. Um, so if um, case in point, I want to go to a government organization for a program or something, I make sure I have. Um, yes, you probably have, you have to represent yourself very well, address the, the occasion first and also just have people that are able to support you. So 
you know, it also takes a level of understanding the situation. If I if I am going to an investor, I've had cases where I have to call a male friend and say, so today you are, you know, head of marketing for Eco Butter. So that way they take you more seriously. If you're going to a government agency, you have to wear, you know, a certain kind of dress. So, you know, they respect a certain kind of weight. Right. Um, on the say time and balancing level, I've had to again make sure I have as many help as I can as I can get. And I think one other um, very interesting way that I've addressed some of these issues and made sure that you know I keep building is just to always speak up and seek help. So women, and again, most of the women I interact with in Nigeria have this thing about just wanting to be super women, super women. And I tell anybody that knows me that I, I want to be a soft girl. Yes, I want to lead. I, I, I want to solve problems for the world and I want to make money and I want to, you know, build a successful business. But deep down and amongst all of this, I also want to just be a very soft girl that is well taken care of and, you know, enjoys her life. So whenever I have issues, whenever I need help, I am very, very quick to speak up and ask for help. And all of this has, has really helped in, you know, shaping who I am now and the level that the business is at. Thank you. Thank you, Rita, for, for your experience. I think it's good that you reminded us, you know, that, you know, the several hats that usually women wear. And uh, being a young mom, I suppose that is also, you know, an added, an added layer of com complexity somehow into this equation. But it's also very important that you remind us that we are not alone. I mean, I think I, I was also reminded yesterday during the meeting that women networks are very important. And this is something that we necessarily need to encourage. I mean, sometimes we really feel that we have to do everything by ourselves and uh, that's not the case you always can get helping hands right and uh, i think that's uh, that's a crucial part also of knowing when to ask for help because that's uh, otherwise you can really collapse under you know the the weight of all the responsibilities and the different uh, you know exigencies that you put on yourself you know so i thank you thank you i think it's a very very um, i would say inspiring inspiring experience um well matthias um, I would like to ask you, I mean, about access to education. You know, access to education is fundamental for women's empowerment, as we all know. So how does UNIDO LKDF address the barriers to education for women in the regions it operates in? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I guess the first thing is, of course, to recognize the barriers women face. Uh, and that's the first step. And they can range from from uh, societal stereotypes or a lack of resources and representation. And of course, we we do what we can to dismantle those uh, and try to create an environment that uh, allows women to thrive. And I think uh, it it often it starts with obviously we we have gender experts who help us in the different projects who help us uh, understand exactly the, the the barriers and what the challenges are and 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 so on uh, but it's also you know it's easy to forget but i think it starts with providing the the conditions and that can be you know not forgetting simple things like uh, gender neutral uh, showers in the schools that we that we produce you know or uh, uh, facilities. I mean, um, but I also think what Hannah mentioned is really important: the economic case. So, you know, the LKF projects are all uh, in the vocational training area, so it's providing skills for people. And of course, uh, the the real way of making that uh, attractive is to show that there is an economic that it leads to a job, and that's also. The main reason why we work, you mentioned that we work in public-private development partnerships, and that's uh, simply a way for us to work closely with private sector partners. And why do we do that? Well, it's because, you know, the main challenge in, in providing the right skills is to make sure that the skills that people get are the ones that are in demand in the in the labor market. So uh, that also needs to be communicated, that uh, this kind of uh, Male dominated uh, training actually leads to to a job. There's a high high uh, possibility for that. So um, we do that. And, and of course, we we from the LKDF, we do a lot of work on, on communicating, creating awareness. And, and yes, if you've uh, followed us, we do work a lot with the different role models that I talked about before. And we use that to engage communities uh, and conduct uh, awareness campaign campaigns. Uh, try to work with local uh, organizations to to create support and encourage women. 
and um, that is in a nutshell I, I guess what we what we see is is working Thank you, Matthias. And thank you also for, you know, I, I, I had recently I was reminded by the, the director of industries in Uruguay, how important it is also to to get training for women in, at the occupational level. You know, she said, you know, we speak a lot about sometimes tertiary education, careers, etc. But she said, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we really definitely lack, you know, sort of workers, women workers that are able to do, you know, the, the kind of more more technical, more, more occupation, occupations really that are related to to industry and are related to all these technical these technical fields which is also a very important I think dimension for for the inc women inclusion you know proper women inclusion especially in the industrial sector um I think we have still one time a little bit of time so if I can ask you to be very very brief just replying one question so we can talk a little bit about the future. So I would like to ask you, how do you envision the future trajectory of women in STEM fields? And what steps do you believe are necessary to ensure greater representation and success for women workers, leaders or entrepreneurs in those in these uh, industries? So I don't know who wants to, to take the floor. Um, well, maybe Hannah, let's start. <laughs> Same order, the usual can't subject. change anything. <laughs> So, uh, really briefly, I, I think uh, many times it is still um, what you measure and what you follow up and what you put put your mind onto. That's also what will start happening. I was mentioning the ambitious goals of uh, having a 50-50 gender split by 2030. And and that that is really ambitious, but that is also something that is followed up. It is not only HRs or marketings or communications. It is everybody's uh, accountability as well. It is followed up the, in in uh, every business review. It is linked to the in incentives of of top management. So the whole company and the leaders in the company need to walk the talk, uh, just like. Uh, uh, an example when organizations have have changes uh, and new, for example, leadership teams are are being formed, uh, they, you know, really need to have a very diverse representation and that is followed up. So, you know, so somebody coming to the CEO with a, a, a suggestion of, uh, you know, 20% women and 80% men, they are too ashamed to even come with that uh, proposal that, you know, they need to really work uh, their butts off to, to make sure they have considered every option and doing bold decisions and, and uh, difficult decisions uh, as, well, uh, as well. And here again, there are so many unconscious biases that we need to tackle, and that's why also uh, I'm a huge fan of the unconscious bias training trainings that at least we have uh, in in uh, arranged to our our managers and to the whole organization. Uh, so a few things: focus on recruitment, uh, female recruitment, follow up, split the targets into more concrete, you know, uh, monthly targets. Look at your job ads. Are they inclusive? Are they uh, bias free? Do simple, small changes. You can actually get big impact. Uh, have the succession su succession planning in, in place. Every time a female leader leaves, make sure you always have female candidates in the in the uh, short list and in the final interviews and take those role models and and uh, have those uh, spread uh, the the word and and create the spark. Thank you very much, Hannah. Susanna, please. Thank you. I think Hannah said it all <laughs> already, <laughs> but or underlining each and every one of those points and and what you measure is is what you get in a way. Um, what to add to that i think is also when we talked a lot about a lot about the retention and uh, keeping the talent i think it's uh, very important that we understand and dig deeper into the root causes of why we are then losing talent and what are the underlying structures that prevent us uh, to keep the talent uh, for example, do we have enough flexibility in our uh, ways of working and, and do we offer that? Because as we talked about the many hats of, of women, for example, I think that is one topic which is very closely related to, to that. 
and to ensure that we can remove such barriers and understand that what is keeping our, our uh, people from or female talents from from growing and, and developing and, and so forth. So I think that that would be what I would add to that. Plus, then the, the role modeling, I think there that having a, a structured or formalized mentoring and, and uh, sponsorship. And I think it's important to also distinguish between mentoring and sponsoring. And I think, yes, mentoring probably is a lot already there, but really have sponsorship in the organizations, more senior people who can support the career development and growth of, of female talent. But I think I'll stop there to allow also Matthias and, and Rita some time to close. Uh, Rita, please. Okay, so obviously we, we're all thinking about the same thing because for me, the first thing is for women that are currently, you know, in the STEM space to keep speaking up. We need to talk more. We need to show that, yes, women are actually taking up space and taking up leadership roles in the STEM space. And um, closely to that is also the need for role modeling and mentoring. We have to be very deliberate about mentoring, you know, young female to find it interesting to even come into the STEM space. And of course, the last one is no matter what it is, we have to make it cool. We have to make it very, very cool, very, very attractive for um, young female to, you know, even think to come into STEM. You know, Anna mentioned how most people think that it is boring. It is not boring at all and there is a lot of cool things in STEM that yes we have to keep being very deliberate about bringing this up about you know talking about them constantly and you know even on such forums um, such as this so yeah that's it from me thank you Rita Matias yeah I, I don't really don't know what uh, I can add more to that that's uh, that's also very very good comments uh, I, I guess the only thing is maybe to um try to emphasize that stem and stem training is is a great opportunity so it it it's like a, a door opener to to many things and that's you know I, I guess i've been talking about all the positive things that you can promote and to to you know have positive examples and i think that's that's something that that needs to be uh, remembered that that it is uh, a door opener that it has you know it carries opportunities. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and uh, thank you very much for this very, very enriching discussion to all of us. I think we are probably have to close because we have only you know a couple of minutes left. But uh, I would really like to first of all say that uh, as we come to to the end of this uh, of this session, uh, I would like to really express my gratitude, of course, to all your you know our our esteemed speakers and participants for their valuable insights and contributions. Um, a special note of appreciation is due, of course, to to our co-organizer, the government of Finland, for the gracious collaboration and support in making in the event possible. I think that through our discussions, we have really dealt on the importance of closing the gender gap in STEM, exploring success stories, confronting challenges, and envisioning a more inclusive future. Uh, from youth engagement programs to diversity initiatives and entrepreneurial journeys, uh, each narrative has underscored the transformative power of empowering, empowering women in these crucial fields. Um, I would like to emphasize the vital intersection of gender equality and environmental sustainability and recognizing the pivotal role that women of women in driving progress towards greener and more equitable futures. Um, as we conclude, let us carry forward in the spirit of collaboration and determination that has defined our conversation today. You know, let's remember the targets, let's remember the objectives. We really have to be, you know, very persistent, I think, in this task. And let us continue to work together across sectors and borders, uh, learn to each other, dismantle barriers, uh, create opportunities and champion gender equality in STEM industries. I think together we, we can, of course, build a world which is better for everyone and, and uh, allow everybody to thrive and contribute to a brighter tomorrow. So having said so, I wish you a very, very nice afternoon for those who are in Europe. Good morning for those who are in America or elsewhere. And uh, let's let's try to continue our task. And, uh, and thank you so much for being there. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.
Thanks. Bye all.